Greetings, friends. My name is Jessa McLean, and I'm here to provide you with some blueprints of disruption. This weekly podcast is dedicated to amplifying the work of activists, examining power structures, and sharing the success stories from the grassroots. Through these discussions, we hope to provide folks with the tools and the inspiration they need to start to dismantle capitalism, decolonize our spaces, and bring about the political revolution that we know we need. We called this episode No Pride in Genocide because it centers around Gary Kinsman's recent resignation from Pride Toronto after their refusal to adequately address the genocide in Gaza. But as Gary takes us through the organization's history, as well as his most recent advocacy on the issue, there's a whole lot more to unpack about Pride Toronto than we expected. Gary also does a really great job of explaining exactly why Palestinian solidarity is a queer issue. Welcome, Gary. Can you introduce yourself, please? Um, Good morning. It's great to be here. Um, So my name is Gary Kinsman. I'm a longtime queer liberation and anti-capitalist activist, probably coming out in 1972. So I've been involved in a lot of things. Some people would characterize people like me as dinosaurs who've been around for a long time. Other people would call me an elder, but I have been involved in various forms of gay or queer liberation activity since about 1972. And that includes going to Pride Days in the 1970s when they were actually held in August to commemorate the We Demand demonstration in Ottawa, which was the first lesbian and gay rights demonstration in the country that was criticizing the limitations of the 1969 criminal code reform. But more specifically, I got really involved in 1981. 1981 was the year that the police offensive against the gay men's community in particular took on a much more heightened form in terms of the bath raids. I mean, hundreds of men were arrested in February of 1981, and there were massive demonstrations uh, that were held by people in the streets. We sort of turned the city on its ear. The police had intended, I think, for us to just disappear when they raided the bathhouses. And instead, they provoked this massive response that not only included you know, gay men and lesbians and gender diverse people, but also included people from the Black community, the South Asian community, feminists, the the labor unions, everyone was opposed to these bath raids. Um, So I was involved also in the left, as well as in the gay liberation movement. One of the groups I was involved in in 1981 was called Gay Liberation Against the Right Everywhere. And we were organizing against the moral conservative right wing. This is the time of Anita Bryant, Jerry Falwell, the so-called moral majority, which we call the immoral minority. So we were organizing a whole series of activities against the rise of the right wing. But I was also involved in the Right to Privacy Committee, which was the main defense organization for the hundreds of men who were arrested in the bath raids. Those of us in Glare, Gay Liberation Against the Right Everywhere, thought in 1981, after the major resistance to the bath raids seemed to be dying down a bit, And after we'd done a series of educational workshops on how to fight the right wing that actually led to the emergence of groups like Lesbians Against the Right, which was the major lesbian feminist organization in the city at that time, we thought it was about time that we actually started to mark the anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion. So we thought we'll make a proposal to people about organizing an event that's both about celebration and pride, but also about resistance and organizing Um, against the police repression we were facing that day. Stonewall was against police repression. Our resistance to the bath raids was against police repression. So we initiated uh, the Lesbian and Gay Pride Day Committee involving members of GLARE, Gay Liberation Against the Right Everywhere, Lesbians Against the Right, the Right to Privacy Committee, and a number of individuals. And that's where the Lesbian and Gay Pride Day Committee in 1981 came from, that Pride Toronto still traces its history back to. And as you're aware, I've recently resigned from Pride Toronto. And one of the things I cite is what that actual history is um, as compared to how they often reconstruct and sanitize that history. So I'm I'm an activist. I'm also a researcher, a writer. Um, I just have the third edition of the Regulation of Desire come out. 
Uh, so I'm involved in all sorts of different things, but I've been an activist for a long, long time. The book you just mentioned, the second part of that title is Queer History, Queer Struggles. Is that right? Just to give people an idea of, of what that book is about. And That's correct. Yeah. So you've described yourself basically as a founding member of Toronto Pride. Can I, is that a good generalization? Yes. Yes. I think that's that's accurate. Although there were Pride events prior to that. It's the first time that we were really marking the Stonewall Rebellion as the, the major point of celebration or the major point of, of remembering. But we called ourselves the Lesbian and Gay Pride Day Committee then. We were not an incorporated group. We were a community-based organization. What calls itself Pride Toronto now, which traces its history back to then, is actually an entirely different type of organization that's based on getting lots of corporate and state funding and is based on being incorporated, it based on having an executive director, a board of directors, a staff, but we didn't have a staff at all in 1981 and in the early 1980s, right? We were really a community-based group. So what is calling itself Pride Toronto now and claiming a history going back to 1981 is actually a very, very different type of organization. I think it would surprise people to know the level of politics, though, that are involved in what what I think most of the public would see is just like a, an annual parade, even if they understand the route. But there's layers because I, I read your re letter of resignation that we're definitely going to get into. But what what did surprise me was it felt a lot like being involved with union politics or perhaps even partisan politics and just the use of general meetings and having to put motions forward and having them ignored. And so for listeners who are trying to catch up here <laughs> and Gary will give us like the nitty gritty details, but yeah, I read a letter of, of resignation after months of advocacy within Pride Toronto and seemingly rebuffed. Maybe you could take us through that. I know you didn't do this alone. I mean, your letter of resignation was for you and for a long time position. Um, that must have been very difficult. But what is it that upset you? After Surely there's been ups and downs because you stuck through pride through um, Black Lives Matter. You, you mentioned it in your letter and it did when, when I read your resignation letter, it gave me the vibes even before I got to that paragraph of this lack of understanding of intersectionality uh, within Pride Toronto and maybe folks who don't remember that um, during a Pride Toronto parade at one point, uh, Black Lives Matter was leading the parade, right? They were at a place of honor and they got to an intersection and sat, right? College, college and young. Thank you. And there was a lot, it, it was to protest the involvement of police in pride, which has its a huge history uh, as well, right? Which is tied to all of this. But uh, it was the backlash uh, that came from within the community. Obviously everyone outside the community always has their opinion about pride and Black Lives Matter. And that, that was that. But it was surprising, I think, for people who understood the roots of uh, the LGBT movement and the involvement of Black people within that movement, and their, at, not even just their involvement, their leadership uh, in the establishment of Pride, and to kind of feel that tension there. And so I feel like we're feeling that tension again around another issue. So I'm going to let Gary pick up, obviously, because, yeah, like, what made you leave now after all the history that you have with them? So let, let's just go back a little bit further. I'll come back to Black Lives Matter and 2016 in a second. Um, there was a group that was formed to support queer and trans Palestinians called Queers Against Israeli Apartheid. 2010 to 2015, I think, is basically when Quaya exists. And when it tried to organize, because of the new sort of way in which Pride Toronto was or was organized, dependent on funding from state agencies and corporations, there was an attempt to actually ban and censor Quaya. So there were, there were major struggles that go back a lot earlier than Black Lives Matter, where every time they tried to ban and censor Quaya or Palestine Solidarity Voices within Pride Toronto and, and the parade in particular, that was defeated. But it took an incredible amount of energy from people trying to organize Palestine's solidarity. When it shouldn't have, right? When it shouldn't have, and when people 
we're really trying to organize people in the queer and trans communities to support the boycott divestment sanctions campaign modeled on South Africa against Israeli apartheid, which of course people are now doing in the current context uh, with Palestine as well. Then in, in 2016, you have this new organization, Black Lives Matter Toronto, designated as the honored group for Pride Toronto. That means it's actually at the front of the march. And just to, to clarify, Black Lives Matter Toronto was actually like centered on gender diverse trans and queer people. Um, a lot of white people, especially white gay men, didn't want to recognize that and sort of wanted to say, this is from outside our communities when it actually was quite inside our communities. And they decided, Black Lives Matter Toronto, and I was in the contingent to try to provide some safety for people in it as a supporter. Um, they stopped the parade for more than half an hour. Um, they had two spirit people coming in doing um, ceremonies, all sorts of things were going on. There was an incredible amount of support for what people were doing with the Black Lives Matter contingent. You are quite right that one of the central demands was around the removal of Toronto Police Services from the parade and festival, from being within it, because of the incredibly anti-Black racist practices of the police, uh, the murders of, of Black people, the harassment of, of Black people. But there were a whole series of other community demands that were made as part of that that were long-standing community demands by people in the Black queer community and Black queer and trans communities, the South Asian um, Black and trans communities, uh, for queer youth, a whole bunch of those other demands that hadn't been listened to by Pride Toronto were also part of what was raised. The, the, the stopping of the parade or the disruption of the parade, if you want to call it that, was ended when the executive director of Pride Toronto came and said, we agree to all of these demands. Well, they didn't um, in practice. And that's what actually produced a wave of what I would have to say is anti-Black racism coming largely from white gay men within our community, unfortunately. Um, although by the end of the summer, that was all turned around. 80% of the people at all of the meetings, including the next general meeting, of Pride Toronto supported all of the demands that Black Lives Matter Toronto made, which is why the police are still not allowed to march as an institutional presence within the, the parade at this point in time. Uh, so that that was a major sort of point of struggle. I mean, I only rejoined Pride Toronto at that point because Black Lives Matter Toronto asked people to join in solidarity with them and help to organize so that the, the next annual general meeting in January of 2017 was actually like more than 80%, probably 85% of the members supported every single demand of Black Lives Matter Toronto, including keeping the police out. And every time they've tried to change that decision, and it's really important to note the executive director of Pride Toronto, the board of directors of Pride Toronto, the ex-mayor, John Tory, um, lots of funders tried to get Pride Toronto to include the police marching again. And people have continued to resist that. I'm now a member of the No Pride in Policing Coalition, which was formed in 2018 to make sure that the police were never able to march again in Pride. So those are things that have happened in the past. And now we're dealing with a situation where since, I mean, this, it goes back decades, right? But there's really been an intensification of the genocide that's been going on against the Palestinian people. So the question then becomes, what does this mean for queer and trans people? And what does it mean for organizations like Pride Toronto? So that's the, the big question that was raised. I, I should point out that people from the Global South, queer and trans people from the Global South um, have actually been very adamant in saying that people in the North and West, queer and trans people in the North and West have to address this question. An organization was formed within Palestine, called Queers in Palestine, that issued what they call the liberatory demand from Queers in Palestine, asking for people in the global queer and trans communities to do a whole series of solidarity actions. So Javier Davila, myself, and other people who are members of Pride Toronto, asked them to support what Queers in Palestine were asking for. 550 queer and trans organizations around the world are supporting what queers in Palestine have asked for. But what we've seen is this significant refusal over and over again to address this. It's really good 
that Pride Toronto is now calling for a ceasefire, but they construct what's going on in Gaza as only a humanitarian crisis, and they don't actually say how and why this humanitarian crisis is being created, nor do they take up how the Canadian state and government and corporations and banks are directly involved in support for the genocide that's currently going on. So this raises really important questions because if you go back to where queer and trans liberation comes from, it comes from support and solidarity for all oppressed people, including all of those forms of oppression that are interlocked with the oppression of queer and trans people. And basically Pride Toronto has refused to do that. And we asked for a special general meeting. So there's two types of meetings that can happen in Pride Toronto. One is a general meeting, which usually happens once a year to, to make a whole series of decisions around finances, um, who's gonna be the auditing firm, who's gonna be on the board of directors. But there's also the possibility of a special uh, general members meeting, if there's an important issue that arises. It's happened on a number of occasions. And Javier and I asked for this to happen in this particular occasion. 19 current members of Pride Toronto supported us in doing that, which is a significant portion of the active membership. And eight former members who are no longer members, but were recently members, also asked for this. 64 community activists asked for this. And a whole bunch of community and movement organizations, uh, Jews Against Genocide, the No Pride and Policing Coalition, uh, Queer, Ont Queer Ontario, um, a whole bunch of organizations, the, the Muslim Network of Toronto, all of these organizations actually asked for this special general meeting to occur. Pride Toronto refused to have that special general meeting. And I felt it's it's no longer possible or tenable or, I mean, I just can't be part of an organization that refuses to actually respond to the demand and call from queers in Palestine that refuses to actually um, understand that we're in an emergency situation right now with the genocide that's going on, with tens of thousands of people being killed and injured, with the ethnic cleansing, with all of the stuff that's going on in Gaza. This is actually a queer and trans issue, and they don't want to recognize it as such. They do not want to criticize the Canadian government because they get some funding from it. They do not want to point out that TD Bank, which is the main sponsor of um, Pride Toronto, and if you go to Pride Toronto events, you will see TD's logo on everything. So it really can look to, to some people like it's TD Pride Day. Um, TD Bank has $16 million invested in General Dynamics, which, cons which makes arms for Israel, both in Canada and the United States. And the, the investment is in General Dynamics in general. But all, not just that, um, TD Bank's also invested and supports Coastal Gaslink, which is what is attacking the land and water rights of the Wet'suwet'en people and nation. I just felt it was no longer possible for me to be a member of an organization that was refusing the call from queers in Palestine, that was refusing to actually understand that queer and trans people have to mobilize and have to be part of the mobilizations against the, the genocide that's going on in, in Gaza and Palestine more generally. I imagine like the frustration of also having to fight within your own organization is extra exhausting. We talk about that a lot when we talk about people within the NDP or other places where they go in, it's supposed to be a progressively built space to better ends. They just end up replicating the oppressive systems we all detest and yeah, tools of suppression uh, used on its members and yeah, frustration, wasted energy, even the like lengthy battles you described leading up to the point that you've gotten to seem like they just exhaust people that could be spending that energy out in doing more community organizing because although you made a great case and I agree with you that uh, the queer struggle and the Palestinian struggle and all our struggles for liberation are intertwined, there are more obvious pressing issues for the queer community, i.e. the attack especially on trans folks and their access to medical care in Canada and 
in schools and all, you know, I don't think the audience is kind of unaware of what's facing them. So, you know, it would be nice if we could just easily do the things that need to be done and then focus energy outward, right? Because there's genuine enemies out there uh, to have to face them within kind of the Pride Toronto setting. But uh, it's not unfamiliar to other people in other spaces who are beholden to sponsors. Like the best, the best groups we talk to here on the show are the ones that that are member funded, right? Then you are free to talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. You can take it in all kinds of direction. You don't have to second guess yourself all the way, like the same way politicians have to kind of couch their language and worry about X, Y, and Z rather than, you know, principled stands. And, you know, Hot Docs is, comes to mind with their relationship with Scotiabank. But so when you write to Pride Toronto and, you know, they're willing to call a ceasefire. So I understand the issues around the language that they're using. I, I, I'm with you there. But they're obviously at a point where they, they call for a ceasefire and you folks have demands beyond that. Do you think their objection is to the cause, the Palestinian cause, or your focus on TD sponsor and their fears there? I think there's probably a relationship. They they basically have told us when we've raised concerns about TD Bank that they need their funding. They need their sponsorship. One of them, board members actually defended Coastal Gas Link, which I was really appalled at, Ew. given what um, Indigenous people and the Wet'suwet'en traditional leadership is saying. They actually said that the band councils, who represent 2 to 3% of the actual area of the Wet Wet'suwet'en Nation support Coastal Gas Link. And they actually have do not have the right to be able to speak for the Wet'suwet'en people and nation as a whole, as BC Supreme Court decisions have decided in the past. So just to come back to some of the things you said, because I think they're really important, is to is to recognize that uh, first of all, I'm, I've been quite involved in the protests against anti-trans organizing, and including in Nova Scotia, where I often live part of the year. Um, and I do have to say that Pride Toronto has not had any real presence at all in any of the major organizing against uh, the anti-trans protests. It's been done by other people. It's been done by anti-fascist, queer and trans activists and other groups of people. So in a certain sense, they're they're not actually... They don't mobilize people at the Fort York P Public Library when drag story time was going on. And we had a large community protest against the anti-trans protesters. And there were lots of what I would characterize as Christian fascists there as part of that protest. There was no one from Pride Toronto there. No one. Right. At many of these events, there's been no one from Pride Toronto. There was the event that was organized by Students for Queer Liberation and other people against the current premier of Alberta after they said all of these things against trans people and they're trying to make movements or legislation against trans people. There was no one from Pride Toronto at that demonstration. So all I'm trying to say is that if you look at it from an activist perspective, even though Pride Toronto says it supports intersectionality, in practice, it does not. Can I ask you a question kind of about its mandate? I don't know if you're you're probably familiar with its charter. So then do they consider their duty as just putting on an annual event and not as advocates within the queer community? If, if you actually look at the, at sort of the, what you might want to describe as the basis of unity or the mandate of the group, they will actually say that they support justice and equality for queer and trans and gender diverse people. Um, but in practice, I think that you're right, that what they really do organize is the Pride Month, a series of activities, the festival, and the parade. That's really what they center on. That's what they're trying to get funds for from corporations and banks. Um, that's what they want to hire people to perform at. They are really not an activist organization in the sense, in any way, shape, or form that I would understand what activism is. So yes, I think in practice, they organize a series of, of largely cultural events, which are great. They organize the festival and they organize the parade. They also help to organize the dyke and trans marches, although those have some autonomy from, from Pride Toronto. And last year, 
the, the trans march actually had so many police at it that the indigenous drumming group had to actually leave it because they felt unsafe because of the police. And unfortunately, the Pride Toronto head, head marshal told people who raised concerns about the police presence to simply leave the trans march. They weren't welcome there. So there's a, a whole series of, of problems. And, and the police did incredible amounts of surveillance, taking video pictures of people, uh, having drones present, uh, taking photos of people, doing a lot of surveillance work on people in the trans march, which I was very concerned about. Oh, rightly so. And our audience will be sold on that completely, completely. I wonder, do you think Toronto Pride could exist without that kind of corporate funding? Like, is there a lot, of, like I've been to Pride and there's like spray booths and like, there's a lot of extra huge sound stages, which are awesome. I mean, maybe not for the folks who live in the towers around that. Uh, um, <laughs> but can that celebration exist still and be part of the entire movement if it's valued in that way? without that corporate sponsorship because that seems like a lot to give up like that's uh, this huge all these connections and the potential for organizing because here we talk over and over again like community organizing is the answer right advocacy and connecting and building communities and to think like all of this energy and general meetings and sponsorship money is just really towards um one part of the movement, right? Like the celebratory kind of, you know, that seems like a big trade-off. Like, I wonder if they'd be willing to go back to the basics if it would just free yourself of that, that muzzle that comes with corporate, corporate sponsorship and, and, and that toxic environment that comes with it. Like the person you're talking about, it's like they're reading TD's pamphlets back to you, you know, like they're, they're using, it's one thing to be like, okay, we need their money. I, I can't raise $4 million. I don't even know what the number is. Like, I can't raise that. We, we got to make them happy that to then be a, their mouthpiece, right? Like they sold their soul in a way, like starting to defend the coastal gas link. So that's a huge trade-off. Can you not go back? <laughs> Yeah, and that's ex exactly what I would want to suggest, and many people have been. So from 1981 to 1986, and Pride was getting bigger every year after we organized the, the first celebration at the time of Stonewall in 81. Um, we had like 1,500 people at 1,000 people on the, on the march, and it was a march then, not a parade. Um, and more and more people started to get involved. We had no corporate sponsorship for the Lesbian and Gay Pride Day Committee until 1986, and things were fine. And we were a community-based organization. We provided free childcare for people. We did all sorts of things. It starts to change with corporate sponsorship. And, and there's a particular problem in 1987 when they actually allow Molson's to become the major sponsor of the beer garden. Molson's at that point was also the Canadian producer and distributor of Coors Beer, <laughs> yeah. which was, there was a major boycott, including within queer and communities in San Francisco, but labor movements, all sorts of people against Coors. And Coors was actually there in 1987, causing a little bit of a rupture with Rights Magazine, which I was then involved in, and the Lesbian Dance Committee, which felt like this is not really what we thought Pride should be, breaking international boycotts. So, I think it is quite possible to organize uh, substantial pride events. And with Abolitionist Pride, we've done this since 2020. And we had more than 2,000 people at the march that we organized last year. And we will be doing stuff again this year. Um, it's po quite possible for community-based organizations to be able to organize a whole series of things during what we call Abolitionist Pride Month um, that includes you know, demonstrations, includes educational events, includes cultural events, and includes um, a, a march as opposed to a, a parade. So I think you're quite right that the drawback of moving in this corporate direction, reproducing within your own form of organizing, corporate forms of organization, which is really what Pride Toronto has done, actually does not produce organizations that are any more accountable to the community and are not related to the, the movement that's actually organizing our struggles right now. So uh, yes, Pride Toronto will say it's opposed to the anti-trans organizing, and they are, but they're not actually doing anything significant about it. Just in spirit, thoughts and prayers. In, in some ways, that, that's what it's like. And it's sort of, 
they now will not allow the police to directly participate with a contingent in the parade, right? Or to be present having like a, a major booth where they're promoting the police during the festival. That's good, but they're actually increasing their level of collaboration with the police um, through permits, through expanding the areas that the police are actually um, you know, doing surveillance work and policing on. Um, so in a certain sense, they've actually undermined in practice the decision that was made in 2017, because now the police are more and more present at the trans march last year. It was incredible how many cops were there. They're present as police on duty, as opposed to, I know it's pink washing, but standing there shooting water pistols at people with lays on, like rainbow lays. Like it's now they're in their gear in intimidating fashion in, in precisely the means that got them banned from pride, right? right? And, and just look at what the police are doing to Palestine solidarity supporters right now, including lots of queer and trans people. I mean, people have to recognize that the Palestine solidarity movement includes lots of queer and trans and gender diverse people. It includes those people living in, in Gaza and in Palestine more generally, but it also includes lots of people here. And Pride Toronto has said absolutely nothing about the expanding police budgets recently or about the violent repression against Palestine solidarity protesters, including, you know, people being, you know, arrested at 4.30 in the morning or so a member of No Pride and Policing Coalition, uh, Desmond, uh, being arrested, right? I mean, they've, they've said nothing about any of these. I could go on and on about it. There's also the people who've been brutalized and attacked by the police as Palestine solidarity activists, many of them queer and trans, and Pride Toronto has said nothing about this, nothing at all. That's just beyond inexcusable. So one can certainly understand how you got to the position that you're in and, and your resignation. But it's good to know that your work is going to continue and is continuing in the form of the No Pride in Policing Coalition and Abolitionist Pride. So thank you so much, Gary, for joining us and for your work. That is a wrap on another episode of Blueprints of Disruption. Thank you for joining us. Also, a very big thank you to the producer of our show, Santiago Halu Quintero. Blueprints of Disruption is an independent production operated cooperatively. You can follow us on Twitter at BP of Disruption. If you'd like to help us continue disrupting the status quo, please share our content. And if you have the means, consider becoming a patron. Not only does our support come from the progressive community, so does our content. So reach out to us and let us know what or who we should be amplifying. So until next time, keep disrupting.